But I wanted to start out with, I know, um, I know we just went over sort of a little bit of my background, but I want to, there's a reason that I want to go over, you know, what my background entails. And so, you know, as, as Brooke mentioned, so I was, a, I, was a, uh, I was with the FBI for 11 years. Most of that time I spent in the behavioral analysis units in Quantico, Virginia. I did violent crime profiling, so the traditional you know, serial killer behavioral analysis type stuff for six years. And then during that time, I helped create a database that was used to link uh, serial violent crimes across state lines and across jurisdictional lines, which was really my first you know, step into the quote unquote cyber world. And because I had that, you know, cyber experience, I guess, um, I was tapped to uh, come on board and help create the FBI's Cyber Behavioral Analysis Center in 2012, which takes all those concepts that have been used uh, in the violent crime profiling world and applied them to cyber threats and cyber threat actors to look at those threats in a different lens, from a different perspective, Instead of looking at it from a purely technical perspective, we're now looking at it from a behavioral and psychological perspective, um, both sort of how the how the attacks unfold and also about a little bit more about the, the actors themselves. And then in 2015, I left uh, the FBI to move out to the private sector. And over the past uh, over the past seven years, I've built uh, uh, cyber threat intelligence teams at three different companies. And primarily, I've been focused on social engineering attacks, both on the phishing side, both consumer-focused phishing, so like phishing attacks targeting uh, bank users and things like that, and then also on the enterprise side with things like business email compromise, both of which we'll get into a little bit more later. And I give you this overview of my background, not to sort of show you who I am and wh where I've been and sort of tell you about you know, my, my awesome experience, but to really show you that my background isn't very technical. Um, you know, I would not say that I'm, you know, a very sophisticated malware analyst. My background is more in the psychology. My, my education is in psychology. Uh, behavioral analysis was what I've done for most of my career. And I think it's important to point that out because it's, it's very important that today that Today's cyber threat landscape is more based around behavior and exploiting people's psychology than it is about the technological aspects of those attacks. And so it's really important to sort of point that out that cyber attacks are not overly technically sophisticated. And to point that out, you know, one of the things uh, I'll show you is, you know, to drive this home, this, this data is from the most recently released uh, FBI internet crime report from the Internet Crime Complaint Center, or IC3, that was released uh, just a few weeks ago. And it essentially shows you for criminal cyber attacks, what types uh, of attacks the FBI is seeing as, and is getting reported to them every single year. And what's really interesting is when you look at all of these different types of attacks, what would be considered social engineering or non-technically sophisticated attacks, which is essentially social engineering, accounts for about $6.4 billion of all financial losses in 2021, which is more than 80% of all money that's lost to cyber attacks. And so while a lot of people think of things like ransomware attacks as the predominant cyber threat that people face today, that's actually not the case at all. And I think you have even some of the uh, categories that I didn't sort of highlight on in this table also could be, in many cases, be considered non-technical in nature. When you talk about things like uh, personal data breaches, a lot of times those are, uh, those are done through, through phishing attacks. Identity theft, same thing there. Um, and, but you know, just to sort of be more conservative in this estimate, you know, $6.4 billion out of what I believe is $7.8 billion of total losses last year um, is, is very, very significant. And it really drives home the, the, the point that social engineering attacks are really the way that cyber criminals are doing business today. So I want to go over a little bit of some of the specific types of scams that are uh, that are that have become more common in recent years. The first one I want to talk about was romance scams that I know uh, Brooke and Emily had both mentioned to me um, prior to this presentation. 
And romance scams are really interesting in the fact that when you look into them in more detail, they are really the cornerstone of all social engineering attacks out there. And I'll, I'll go into why that is here uh, in, in, a, in, a, in just a second. But romance scams have been around for literally thousands of years. And just like what's really interesting about social engineering as a whole is the social engineering is so common today because it's relatively easy to do. As long as human beings have been on this earth and we've been interacting with one another, we've been socially engineering each other. The only difference is now we're doing it through a computer instead of doing it face-to-face -face or over the phone or through the mail. But all the same concepts that are used today in things like phishing attacks are the exact same concepts that have been used for thousands of years to con people. And romance scams, it's also, it's also very similar. The same concepts that have been used to con people in, uh, in romance scams for hundreds, of, if not thousands of years, are exactly the same uh, that they are today. The only difference is now we have things like social media and dating websites where a lot of these scammers are finding their victims. And so a lot of the initial approaches for romance scams are coming on those sites. And what's really interesting about romance scams is that they aren't quick hit scams. They aren't scams, generally speaking, where you're going to have a scammer who is going to quickly ask for money and then they're going to go away. These are sort of long con scams that are going to play out over months and sometimes even years. Um, I've seen romance scam victims that have been uh, having a conversation or thinking they're in a relationship with a scammer for three or four years. Um, and what's really interesting when you look at those victims is the psychology of why those victims become victims um, and is, is, is very interesting. Many times you see these romance scam victims, they may be divorced, they may be widowed. One thing that I think is a big misnomer with romance scams is that I think a lot of people think that most of these uh, victims are going to be older individuals when the data actually is, shows the exact opposite. Um, while you can see on the, the chart here on, on the right, this is from the, the FBI's IC3 report that came out a couple of weeks ago, so this, is, this is fresh data, that a third of all victims may be over 60 years old, but you also have a significant number of romance victims that are younger. Um, you even have that 2% that's under 20 years old. And so like a lot of cybercrime attacks, they are relatively agnostic in who they're going to target and who they're going to victimize. Um, they're really looking for anyone who may be able to send money, um, regardless of who that person is. Now, one of the interesting things that, that I've done um, in a lot of the research into cyber, uh, cyber attacks recently, especially social engineering attacks, is a lot of my focus has been on uh, things uh, on, on Nigerian actors and West African actors, which we'll get into here uh, in a bit. But as part of that research, I've been able to collect and, and observe a number of the lures that these uh, scammers are using to approach and sort of start that initial conversation with victims. And one of the things that you see over and over and time and time again is that religion is a very common theme in a lot of these initial lures. Um, they, it, which, which would indicate to me that, you know, having a religious, uh, a religious background is something that these scammers are specifically looking to, looking for when they're trying to identify an ideal victim. Um, why, that is, why that is, I'm not exactly sure, um, but it is clear in a lot of the lures or formats is what they call them, uh, a lot of their formats contain religious themes and religious topics. They may say that they are, you know, they're, they're people of faith. They're looking for someone of faith. And you see that time and time again. And so it's a very common theme uh, in the initial conversations that you see with romance scam victims. Um, and then when you look at these victims overall, there is a very significant psychological impact um, that occurs with these victims over the time that they're being scammed. To the point where, you know, not only do they believe that they are essentially in a relationship with this person that they've never met, but they'll also be so protective of the scammer who they think they're in a relationship with, 
that if family members approach them and let them know that they think they're being scammed, or even if law enforcement approaches them and says that they're being scammed, they won't believe them. Or they will simply go back to the scammer and say, law enforcement just came to me and said, you're a scammer. Is that right? The scammer will say no, and the victim will believe them. But it is very psychologically impactful um, for, uh, for, the, for these victims. And then also, when I say that romance scams are a cornerstone of social engineering attacks, what I mean by that is it's not just the scam themselves. These victims are essentially, you know, conned out of all the money they have. They're conned all of, out of all of the money they could have. And then once all of that money has been run out, they're then, they're then leveraged in other ways for things like being a, a money mule, being the person who's going to be receiving fraudulent funds for some you know, per, uh, potential reason. It might be that they need to receive money from a for an insurance payout, or they may need to be, you know, the, the, the their, their quote unquote uh, person that a relationship with needs to receive money overseas from a, uh, from a relative and they need to use the, the, the victim's bank account. They're essentially changed into mules so they can continue to be used throughout the, the scamming process. We've also seen romance scam victims, once all the money's gone, their identities are then leveraged to file fraudulent tax returns, file fraudulent credit card uh, applications and or file fraudulent auto loans and things like that. And so these victims are essentially milked for everything that they possibly can get, um, that, that the scammers can get out of them for as long as possible. Um, and it's, it's, you know, when you see the, the overall impact to these victims, it's, it's really sad. It's easily one of the most devastating scams that's out there. Um, because it is so psychologically impactful. And so romance scams are really the, the big uh, individually targeted scams that we see today. Some other common scams that we see today that are targeting individuals are things like investment scams. If you look at the most recent IC3 report, you'll see that investments, the, the overall financial loss to investment scams skyrocketed last year too. I think it was $1.3 billion was lost. Uh, to, to investment scams. And the primary reason for this is primarily because of the rise of cryptocurrency uh, investment scams. Cryptocurrency scams over the past years have really taken off exit scams from, uh, from cryptocurrency exchanges uh, that are doing sort of fake exits um, have become more and more common. And that has really driven a lot of the investment scams we've seen recently. Things like real estate and rental scams. And what I mean by these scams, they're pr pretty much going to be, um, you have a scammer who's asking to rent or buy um, uh, uh, a property. And in that process, they're going to pay some money up front that's not going to be real and ask for some money back in return. This is very different than something like a, uh, a compromised real estate transaction, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, um, that can be, you know, significantly more money can be lost in those, but we'll talk about those here uh, shortly. Things like inheritance scams, where you may have a scammer who is emailing uh, a number of individuals saying that there's an inheritance that's been left for a potential victim overseas, and, uh, and, and in order for them to, uh, to get the money, they have to pay some sort of, of a processing fee or insurance fee or something like that. Um, usually those are going to be in the, in the, um, uh, in the neighborhood of a couple hundred, if that's thousands of dollars. And then you have the advanced fee fraud. So if anyone's heard of the Nigerian print scams that have literally been going on now for, uh, for 30 plus years, um, those are the exact same scams that are going on today. Um, the, you know, advanced fee fraud, you know, encompasses a, no, a large number of different types of scams that are essentially in order for the victim to receive a supposed payment or item, they need to pay the scammer a certain amount of money, or they could have been over, you know, supposedly overpaid, and they need to pay money back to, uh, to the scammer in order to, uh, in order to complete the transaction. Advanced fee fraud has been going on for a number of years. It's very, very common. Many of these scams are things that when you look at them, I would guarantee most people would say, who would actually fall for one of these? And yet, because they're still so common, um, and you know the red flags that we tell people to look out for, 
um, you know, the, the grammatical errors, the spelling errors, you know, people coming, make, you know, initiating conversations out of the blue. Um, all of those things are usually present in these types of attacks. Um, but because they still, we still see them all the time, that must mean that the ROI for the cyber criminals must still be there or else it wouldn't happen anymore. And what's really interesting when, it, when we look at cybercrime, it's really helpful to think of it like a business. And at the end of the day, cyber criminals are trying to increase their profit margins and increase their profits as much as possible while doing the least amount of work that they can. You know, one of the things that I've always said is you know, cyber criminals, criminals are inherently lazy. They're going to do the least amount of work possible in order to make the most amount of money possible. And so when you see a lot of these types of scams that most people would look at and be like, are they even putting any effort into them? What's really interesting is that they're not looking for a very high success rate. They're looking for the success rate to be high enough for the amount of energy and effort they're putting into it to be to 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 work well enough for them. So as we move on, you know, I want to move a little bit out of individually targeted attacks and into more enterprise focused or organizational focused attacks. And one of the big things that we've seen in recent years is the rise of credential phishing targeting enterprises specifically. If you go back to about 2016, before 2016, most credential phishing attacks were targeting things like bank accounts or PayPal accounts, individual consumer accounts, where they would, you know, a, a cyber criminal would simply uh, compromise an account, go into that account, and siphon all the money out of that account. Around 2016, we saw a massive shift in the entire uh, cyber threat landscape, not just with, with credential phishing, but with other uh, types of attacks like ransomware as well. With ransomware, we saw a lot of the main groups pivot away from individuals as targets and toward enterprises as targets because they knew that they could get more money out of those organizations than they could out of uh, individual, uh, individual victims. Very similar to what we saw with credential phishing. In around 2016, we started to see a massive rise of things like uh, Office 365, DocuSign, Dropbox, Adobe phishing attacks that were all meant to compromise enterprise credentials to get access primarily to, to email back then. And the reason for this is because the value of email credentials, especially enterprise email credentials, is very, very significant because those accounts can be used in a number of different ways. They can be, you know, they can, they can be used to simply uh, send out additional phishing messages from a, trusted, uh, from a trusted source. They can be used to pivot to other uh, cloud applications, things like, uh, things like SharePoint, uh, to, to steal, to steal, uh, to steal uh, sensitive information from those accounts. They can be used to simply just sit on the accounts, observe the communications going back and forth, and then launch very sophisticated business email compromise attacks, which we'll talk about here next. But, the re but because they can be used in so many different ways, the value of these accounts is significantly higher than other types of accounts that you might see out there that might be compromised with cyber, cyber crime attacks, cyber attacks. And so when we look at the primary focus of a lot of cyber attacks today, credential phishing is one of the top, uh, top reasons for that. And one of the things that sort of pivots off of credential phishing is business email compromise, which is easily today's biggest cyber threat. Um, when you look at the amount of money lost to business email compromise attacks compared to other cyber attacks, it's not even close what is the, the biggest, uh, causes the biggest loss. About 35% of all cyber, cyber crime losses can be attributed to BEC. And what is, what is a business email compromise attack specifically? The definition that I use is it's essentially a spear phishing attack or a tar specifically targeted attack that involves the impersonation of a trusted individual or entity to trick a person into making a financial transaction or sending materials of, or sending sensitive materials that can, that can be of other, other value to the attacker. Essentially it's impersonating a trusted individual for the purposes of getting, getting that person to do something. 
And traditionally, when BEC attacks really started coming out into the scene in about 2015, 2016, um, a lot of these attacks were, were going to be, you know, impersonating a CEO, asking for a wire transfer to a, uh, to a you know, supposed new vendor. And while we still see those all the time, we still see things like payroll diversion attacks that are asking, that are impersonating an employee asking for their, their payroll account to be changed, or even things like gift card attacks as someone impersonating a, a supervisor or executive at a company asking an employee to, to go out and buy $2,000 worth of iTunes gift cards. Those still happen today, but I think the, the, the sort of the, the subcomponents of BEC attacks that I think will be of more interest to the folks um, on this call are going to be the ones on the right-hand side of the screen. And they're a little bit different than those traditional BEC attacks. And those are going to be things like real estate specific BEC attacks, legal or M&A BEC attacks, and vendor email compromise. And what all of these have in common is that there's a compromise at some point, at, in some place in the communication channel or of a financial transaction that takes place in order for the attacker to create a very realistic looking and sophisticated uh, lure uh, email. And so when it comes to things like real estate BEC attacks, you're going to have you know, the compromise of one of the, uh, the stakeholders in that transaction. It could be the buyer, it could be the seller, it could be a realtor, it could be one of the attorneys, um, one of the closing attorneys. Anywhere along those lines, each one of those people have access to communications and documents that a cyber criminal would be able to use to insert themselves into a transaction that will allow them to redirect funds from that, uh, from that, from those transactions to another bank account. Many times what you see here are going to be uh, the attacker targeting the buyer uh, in, in, a, in a real estate transa transaction uh, in, a, in, in an opportune time that makes contextual sense. Say something like, you know, your, uh, your initial payment is, is going to be due or your final payment's going to be due. Uh, we've just had an updated account, please send it here instead. And so the, 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 the buyer, when everything looks very accurate and legitimate, it's using context that, uh, that, that has been uh, used in pr prior communications, everything looks completely normal. And without any external validation, a lot of victims go ahead and fall for that. For things like M&A uh, transactions, we see those have become much more popular in recent years where very similarly, you have a, an attacker who inserts themselves into an M&A uh, transaction and says that, you know, it might say that, you know, we need to get 10% of the overall value of this transaction uh, paid into a certain account by a certain date. Um, they have all of the information for the actual full transaction, and they're trying to, to get a share of it sent to a fraudulent account. And then vendor email compromise attacks. When you look at BEC, that big $2.6 billion number uh, that the FBI reported last year, vendor email compromise is makes up a significant component of these types of attacks. If you've ever seen uh, a BEC attack in, uh, in the reported in the media, usually those are going to be of the vendor email compromise variety, primarily because the amounts that's lost in those types of attacks is significantly higher than other sort of more traditional BEC attacks. I think it's about $180,000 on average is lost to a vendor email compromise attack. And very similarly, um, it's going to be a, a small vendor or supplier is generally going to be compromised in those attacks. And the attacker will sit on those accounts, collecting information about that vendor and suppliers, uh, customers, understand when payments are due, how much payments are due, they might steal copies of invoices. And they'll use all of that, that intelligence to insert themselves into an actual transaction, an actual payment that's going to be due down the road um, that crafts, again, a very realistic looking uh, email to one of that, those vendors or suppliers customers. And all of these, what all of these have in common is that in many cases, the organizations or the entities that are making the payment that are sending out the payment are not generally going to be the ones that are compromised to begin with. Um, and that is going, that's why as we get into this sort of what you can do to protect yourself, that's always why you know, payment validation through a secondary means is so important. 
because the compromise may not be within your own environment. It's, it's very likely actually, when you see attacks like this, that the compromise is going to be from an external third party. So who's behind these scams at the end of the day? Now, so based, you know, based on a lot of the research that I've done, you know, a lot of the social engineering attacks that we see today is coming from actors that are based out of West Africa, primarily Nigeria. The reason for this is that social engineering has been ingrained in their essentially culture for decades at this point as a you know, quote unquote, legitimate way to make a living, a legitimate occupation. And this, the reason for this, you know, when you think about the Nigerian print scams that started back in the 90s, you know, a lot of that, a lot of the evolution in social engineering has really come from those, uh, from, from those, from those roots back in the 90s. And all we've seen is that a lot of the same tactics just being used in different ways, even, even in things like more sophisticated vendor email compromise attacks, it's all the same type of manipulation of behavior and psychology. And these scammers have gotten really good at understanding how to manipulate people, especially certain groups of people in certain ways. Now, the reason that we see a lot of this coming from, uh, from Nigeria, not only is because they're, they are essentially good, really good, and they have a lot of experience uh, in social engineering, but also it's, it's, we see very high unemployment uh, in Nigeria, especially with younger individuals. Uh, as high as 50% of, uh, of young adults are unemployed in Nigeria. And we know that a lot of the uh, the information sharing, the way that they learn how to run these scams are shared in universities and schools. Many of the scammers that I've spoken to personally have really good educations. Sometimes they've graduated from university. Sometimes they have masters or PhDs. The biggest problem is they can't use their knowledge in, in, in legitimate ways because the jobs just aren't there in Nigeria. So they're turning to the, these other avenues um, of, of fraud, which is seen as, as an acceptable way, acceptable way to make a living uh, in, in places like Nigeria. If you look at the right-hand side of the screen, it's really interesting sort of to show you, you know, how centralized these, these scams are in West Africa. The, the, uh, the types of scams that I have highlighted here are all generally going to be coming from West African actors for the most part. Um, and if you add all of that up, we're essentially seeing that 60% of all cybercrime losses can be attributed to a very small region of the world in, in Nigeria. And at any given time, these actors aren't running one of these scams. They're running a dozen or more scams concurrently to one another. So at the same time, they're running a romance scam. They're also going to be doing a business email compromise attack. They're also going to be submitting fraudulent unemployment claims. They're also going to be um, running inheritance frauds or real estate or rental frauds all, all at the same time. Because at the end of the day, this is their job. This is what they do eight to 10 hours of day, a day. I was tracking a, uh, a West African actor about a year ago. And based on my analysis of his day-to-day -day activity, you can actually map out what his actual working hours are. And what was fascinating was that you could see that he was working eight, nine hours a day, and then about two to three hours on the weekend. It was essentially a 40 to 50 hour work week. Um, like anyone else would go to the office or not go to the office these days or log on to their computer, I guess, because everyone works remotely. And, um, and essentially, this is what they did. They were running different types of scams. They were collecting information about potential victims, and then they were sending phishing emails. And that's what they did. And uh, most scammers you see today follow, follow just those same patterns. So one of the things I wanted to share uh, with, with, with you all, though, as I mentioned, I've done a number of interviews with some of these Nigerian actors, some that are directly involved in, uh, in, in, in scams, some are close to people who are involved in scams. Um, what I wanna show you is sort of a, a, a clip of an interview that I did uh, about nine months ago with an actor that was involved with 
um, some interesting ransomware campaigns that were trying to, the, the, the actor was trying to get employees to, uh, to take ransomware and deploy ransomware on a, a corporate network. And, you know, I was able to not only get this individual on a, a Skype call, but also I was able to pivot this and sort of have a more frank discussion with him to better understand his motivations and his tactics that he was using. And so this is a good, a good clip from, you know, in, in his own words of when I asked him, you know, why do you do what you do? I'm a normal guy in the streets of Africa, you know, trying to survive, you understand? I'm trying to survive and it's not easy, you understand? It's not easy in the streets of Africa, in Nigeria. It's very, very hard. So let's just say, you know, there's a thing going on in Nigeria, um, most especially in all the young ones coming up, they all want to do fraud, you know? You understand? But in some people, the cases is to feed their family, you understand? To feed their family and provide ways and also try to just survive. That's just it, trying to survive. So I think that's a really interesting sort of look at how some of these individuals describe why they do what they do. And I can't, like this, this clip that you just heard, I've heard numerous times from numerous other actors uh, and individuals that I've spoken to of why they do what they do. It's essentially, it's a job. They have to feed themselves and their families. You know, it's acceptable over there. And, you know, there's a, a pretty pretty good um, information sharing uh, uh, network of how to do these types of scams. And so if you're forced to not be able to feed your family or yourself or provide for yourself, then what else are you going to do? And so I've heard this time and time again. And, you know, uh, in, in, in some cases, you may see articles out there with people. I don't know if anyone on this, this uh, on the call have heard of uh, individuals like Hush Puppy or Mumfa, which are some of the more prominent uh, Nigerian scammers that have been arrested more recently um, that are flashing, you know, sports cars on, on Instagram or flashing their money. You definitely see a lot of that. You see some individuals who are involved in scams as a way to, uh, to increase their status or make just a ton of money. But for a majority of the scammers that are out there, they're doing it as a, as a job and not as a way to, 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 to have fancy cars and things like that. So getting to sort of near the end of this presentation, how do you protect yourself against these types of attacks? And, you know, at the end of the day, as I mentioned, social engineering attacks are, are, are in some cases very difficult to defend against because they manipulate psychology and they aren't just a technical catch-all. Um, and so when they do, when a, one of these attacks does reach a potential victim, you know, at that point, the a, a potential victim always needs to stop and think about what they're looking at and pause before they actually react to what they're seeing uh, in an email, especially an email that sort of comes out of the blue that they're not expecting. Some things to, to, to keep in mind here is for anyone on the call that has a, a public persona, be very mindful about the amount of information that you post out there publicly, especially on things like social media. I can't tell you how many times social media is used as an intelligence collection tool to, uh, to collect inf information about someone that a scammer will then use in those communications because the information is just there. So understand that while your family and friends may be able to, to see what you're doing on vacation or seeing what you're buying from the store, so can scammers in many cases, and they may use that information to manipulate you. I mentioned this uh, a few slides ago, but you know, as especially when you're dealing with things like uh, pay, uh, financial transactions, 
it's always important to use a secondary communication channel to confirm the identity of the person who's re requesting the transaction. That means that if you get an email from a third party or even someone internally that's requesting a payment, instead of you know, sending that person an email back, pick up the phone and call them and say, you know, John Smith, did you actually request this transaction? I just wanted to verify it before, before I, I, I made it, that transaction. Again, I mentioned stop and think before taking action. And then also when you talk about sort of your accounts, your online accounts, what are some of the best practices to make sure that those accounts can stay safe and secure? The biggest thing to, to keep in mind is do not reuse passwords across accounts. I cannot tell you, I cannot stress this enough, how important it is to make sure, especially your sensitive accounts, that they have unique and complex passwords. The reason for this is one of the main ways that cyber criminals uh, compromise accounts isn't through things like phishing attacks, it's through automated credential stuffing attacks, which is essentially taking a list of uh, known credentials or known passwords and trying them again and again and again through, uh, through for a specific website. And then also what happens is if, a, uh, if an account is compromised through something like a data breach or a phishing attack, and you may have you know, maybe a, uh, a completely you know, unimportant, uh, something, unimportant account on some site that you've never, you haven't used before, what they'll do is that, is that a, a cyber criminal will use those credentials, the username and password, and they will use that credential pair against dozens of other types of, of online accounts. So if you're using your, the same password for maybe your email account and your bank account and your LinkedIn profile and your Facebook account, if any one of those four accounts is compromised, then all four of those accounts could potentially be compromised. And so it's, it's extremely important not to reuse passwords across accounts. Now, to make that a little bit easier to do is it's also very important to use a password manager. I don't care whether it's a physical book that some people have or a, a digital password manager that you have on your computer. Um, any method is fine as long as you are able to create different passwords, different complex passwords for all of your accounts. And then also multi-factor authentication. Um, you may have heard the term two-factor two authentication. It's extremely important to, to, to use when available on especially your sensitive accounts. And when you think about what types of multi-factor authentication uh, you can use today, if you're able to, do, to use something like an app-based authentication tool, something like uh, Google authentication uh, or things like Duo, um, there are a number of sort of app-based authentication tools out there. Those are the preferred method. But if you can't use that, use SMS, use a text message, uh, sort of two-factor authentication. That is much better than nothing. And you might hear some people say that, you know, text messages are not a great uh, way to, to do two-factor authentication. And in some cases, that's true. The two-factor authentication through uh, SMS messages has definitely uh, is definitely able to be you know there there are bypasses for that relatively simple bypasses for some cyber criminals, but it is better than nothing. And in many cases, any type of multi-factor authentication on an account will prevent a, a cyber criminal from going through the hassle of trying to break into that account. They're going to go for the low-hanging fruit in most cases, unless it is a very specifically targeted attack they're going to go after the accounts that don't have multi-factor authentication in place than, uh, than those that, that do. And so those are some very high level, you know, best practices about you know, protecting against these types of social engineering attacks. I want to sort of go back to my, to, to my friend, the scammer, um, to really, you know, one of the things that I spoke to him about was, you know, what can people do to protect themselves against uh, against these types of, of cyber attacks to make sure they don't victims. And this is what he said. For people. What I know. think it would be helpful to people is to invest in cyber security. You understand? Um, if you watch movies like The Laundromat, do you know about them? 
to move in. You know, it was a company that was into money laundering and different dirty stuffs, you know, you understand. They laundered money for presidents and a lot of people. But at the end of the day, their secrets in the company was busted out due to weak cybersecurity. You know, a lot of files of their money laundering activities were posted online, linking to presidents, um, prime ministers, and a lot of people. I think the story is online. Try to watch the movie, The Laundromat. So what I'm trying to bring out is that my advice to people is to invest in cybersecurity. And like I said, within the next five to 10 years, Pfizer will be a sin of the past. All right. So cybersecurity advice from a scammer, invest in cybersecurity. It's worth it. Uh, you know, I, what's funny is, you know, he said at the very end of that, within the next five to 10 years, fishing will be a thing of the past. You know, I, I asked him, I was like, you know, what will you do if, you know, if, you know, if everyone has better cybersecurity and fishing becomes a thing of the past? And he says, I don't know, maybe I'll just go do some farming or something. You know, what's really interesting as you talk to some of these individuals, you know, you sort of have to take what they say with a grain of salt and sort of read between the lines to understand what's what's legitimate, and what's not. Um, but I think it's it's interesting. You know, obviously he's watched this movie, he's seen this movie, he sort of understands how people, you know, can can protect themselves and what the impact of these types of attacks are. Um, but it's kind of interesting getting this uh, getting this perspective from someone who actually runs these types of scams. And then finally, what I will, what I'll end up with here is, you know, what to become, if, if, you, if you, if you or someone, you know, has become the victim of, uh, of a cyber attack, what should you do? You know, first of all, immediately contact your bank and law enforcement. The reason for this is there is, uh, there is a, a good chance if you are able to report something like a business email compromise attack or some other type of financial trends. Uh, fraudulent financial transaction. If you're able to report that very quickly after the, the the scam has taken place, that law enforcement will be able to recover those funds. Um, the FBI has something called the uh, the 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 uh, gosh, um, I've, it's the RAT. It's the Recovery Asset Team, and their whole job is to take reports that have been in things like BEC attacks or other types of fraudulent financial transactions and work with the banks to try to recover those funds. It, when those are reported to the team, when those fraudulent uh, attacks are, are reported to the team, their success rate is about 70 to 75 percent. Um, the problem is that a vast majority of these scams are not reported in a timely enough manner for them to be able to do anything with them. So time is absolutely of the essence to report these to law enforcement to your bank in order to try to give yourself the best opportunity to recover those funds. Also, the FBI's Internet Crime Complaint Center, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, is the best place to report uh, any types of scams because all of, the, all of those reports actually go to a centralized team that review everything that comes in. And if it's able to be actioned, it will be actioned. And so that is one of the best places to report, uh, to report any, any, if anyone's the victim of those types of attacks. Personally, uh, also, if you're able to freeze your credit, absolutely do that to make sure that no, uh, your identity can be used to open up any other accounts. And then even, even if you don't know if passwords have been compromised, or even if a if if one if one account has been compromised, it's always a good idea to change the passwords on all of your sensitive accounts when you've become the victim of any type of scam, because you never know what those uh, cyber criminals could have gotten access to. So if you've ever become the victim of a scam, regardless of what that scam is, always change your passwords just to make sure that you're keeping yourself safe. Again, focusing on those more sensitive accounts that are going to have access to email and have access uh, to, 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 uh, to funds, to money. And with that, that is all I've got for you guys today. Yeah, I really yeah, appreciate yeah. your time. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to take them. Thank you, Crane. Um, we do have some questions that have been submitted throughout the presentation. 
And for those that have them and have not yet submitted them, um, on your Zoom screen, in the middle at the bottom, you'll see a Q&A feature. You can type in your question and it'll come through to us and we can um, ask that then of Crane. So a few questions that have come in, um, specifically to something that you mentioned on the investment scams related to cryptocurrency. The question was, what is a fake exit mm. scam? That's a great question. So, um, so if anyone has heard of you know an ICO, an initial point offering, you know, we've seen you know, while Bitcoin and Ethereum are some of the more popular cryptocurrencies out there, there there are literally hundreds of cryptocurrencies that have been created over the past couple of years. And what you see are you know exchanges that come up um, that are used to to buy these trend, to buy these uh, these cryptocurrencies. And then what you see a lot uh, are you'll see a an exchange come out with an alert saying, "Oh my gosh, you know all of our you know our 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 information was hacked, and all of our uh, all of our tokens have been lost to some to some cyber criminal. Everyone's money's been lost, and they have to shut down." Well, in actuality, in some of those cases, what happens is there was no actual breach. The uh, the uh, the the people who are running the exchanges are simply shutting everything down and taking everyone's tokens. Um, you see that that's become more and more popular, um, and that's essentially what you see as a fake a fake exit scam, uh, a way for them to get out of it, uh, uh, get out of the exchange, take everyone's money, and make it seem like you know they were just breached. One of the many other breaches that you see uh, that are out there. Interesting. Good. Another question uh, that came in. How secure are investment accounts relative to bank accounts when it comes to fraud? Um, and and a, a carry on to that is, have you begun to see attempts of fraudulent withdrawals um, through social e engineering attacks or more of a hard attack, hard attack trying to pull funds? Yeah, um, so so from, from what I've seen, um, the security of bank accounts and investment accounts um, are about the same. I haven't seen anything that's you know would, would show. It's, it really also very much depends on the the institution, um, so that that can differ. I absolutely have seen um, phishing attacks that are specifically targeting um, investment funds, four hundred one ks, IRAs, and things like that. Um, and so that is again, this goes back to the old maxim of cyber criminals: if there's money to be made, they're going to target it. And so there absolutely have been instances where uh, where investment accounts have been the target of, uh, of 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 cyber of cyber attacks and phishing attacks primarily. Okay. And just to piggyback onto that, um, relevant to to our audience here, um, bank accounts have FDIC insurance, and brokerage accounts have what's called SIPC insurance, similar to FDIC but with with different limits. In addition to that, though, Schwab has what's what they call the Schwab guarantee. And they they have guaranteed to make people whole if they are a victim of unauthorized activity. They just ask that it's reported timely and then they do an investigation. And you know, after they determine that um, you know, it was fraud, um, they will make clients whole. So that's noteworthy as well. Good, thank you, Brooke. Another question that came in, is it safe to store passwords on a cell phone as long as it's encrypted? Yeah, so if you're talking about something like, you know, using an iPhone and using the the actual iPhone password storage option, absolutely. Um, if it's encrypted, if or if you're using a password manager on your phone, totally fine. What I would not do um, is store passwords in a note in something like iCloud or even storing any sensitive documents in your notes, because those are not generally going to be encrypted. And a lot of a lot of times what you see are uh, cyber criminals trying to get access to cloud accounts for that data specifically. And so as long as you're using an app or the operating system to store those passwords, then it, it's it's really fine. Also gets to the point, you know, a lot of these sort of sort of a little bit different, but a little bit the same of that, you know, public Wi-Fi. People using public Wi-Fi, if you want to go to Starbucks or use, you know, the airport's sure. Wi-Fi, it used to be that, you know, there was a lot of recommendations to say you shouldn't do that because, you know, you could, there could be things that are, that are called man in the middle of attacks where you have someone who could, you know, pretend to be uh, an access point 
and you might connect to them and they might siphon up all of your data and and you know because it's unencrypted they'd be able to read everything that you're doing nowadays with almost all communication uh, that is it almost all in, uh, communication through the web through the internet is encrypted and so now things like public wi-fi is totally fine to use there's no issues with that for the most part because even if even if someone pretends to be an access point and you connect to them they won't be able to read whatever that whatever that uh, data is anyway um so man in the middle of attacks are not as um uh, as as serious or as big of a threat as they used to be Interesting. I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, to, to follow on to that, um, when I'm logging into a website and I see the option to remember me um, for the future, is that does that count as a password manager or how should I be thinking about that? So it kind of does. And the it's not as good as using a password manager because a lot of times those are still going to be encrypted locally within your browsers uh within within your browsers uh settings and so usually it's not that it's not that big of a deal so unless someone has access to your computer um they won't be able to access those passwords um you know but then again it's if, if you're able to use a password manager instead of doing that that's always the preferable option but the overall the, the overall amount of risk to do that or to save your passwords in your browser is is is, is relatively minimal Good. Another question from the audience, um, is using facial authentication a good idea? Um, I think, I guess it depends on your viewpoint. I guess the, the viewpoint of the question, right? Is, is it more about privacy or is it about, you know, going passwordless? You know, you, there's been a big push recently to just remove passwords in various ways. And I think we're going to move, we're eventually going to get to the point where passwords are a thing of the past, um, where we don't use passwords anymore. We use either third-party apps or biometrics to log into accounts. Um, and so I think biometrics are definitely a, a, a good way to authenticate without using passwords. Um, again, you have the privacy angle, and I think that's a whole different topic for a different day. Um, about, you know, pro people probably have different viewpoints on that. Good. I know that the Social Security Administration experimented yeah. a bit with the facial authentication um, approach for logging in. Yeah. And if you have, if, you, if anyone has like an iPhone, right? I mean, if I, to mm -hmm. log into your phone, they're using facial recognition. And now they use facial recognition. I, I just updated my operating system and now it's not just facial recognition, but it's also, if you have a mask on, they can now recognize your face um, to log into your, to your phone, so. Another question, is it better to ignore an unsolicited business email or unsubscribe? So, yeah, so um, honestly, <laughs> it's, I would say it's better to just ignore them and just delete them. There, I've always been when I've, and I've, I've thought about this literally for years that if I was a cyber criminal, what I would do is I would hide a malicious link in the unsubscribe button of an email, because that's what a lot of people are going to be clicking on. And yet I, have, I cannot think of an actual series of campaigns that have been made any impact that have actually used that tactic. I don't know why. Uh, I would if I was a cyber criminal. Um, so I, I would say it's better to just delete those emails. Um, if you if you can, you know, like Google has in some cases the ability to delete uh, and unsubscribe. You can use that without any issues. Um, but I would just delete it if 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 it's unless you're just getting completely spammed and then. But that's what again that's what the cyber criminals are looking for. That they just completely spam you and you finally click that unsubscribe button. That's how I would do it. But Apparently the cyber criminals don't, don't think like I do. <laughs> Good point. I would have been a victim, I'm sure. I do make use of that unsubscribe button. Yeah. Um, but I'll think twice now. <laughs> so thank you. Um, another question. Could you provide some specific examples of common but risky things that people do on social media that make them more vulnerable to mm -hmm. cyber crime actors? Yeah, so obviously uh, announcing travel is a big one um, because it provides some context for a scammer to use 
not only when contacting you, but also contacting employees at your, at your business or relatives. Um, so it provides some context that they can use in a pretext when, uh, when approaching other, other potential victims. Um, you know, announcing, you know, going really in depth about personal things. It's, it's all about, you know, if, if I can craft a sophisticated pretext or approach to you using what I know about you in social media, then the better I can, the better I can manipulate, manipulate you or create something that's more realistic. And so really it's all about locking your social media off as much as possible to only people you know. And so if you have something like a Facebook account, make sure that, that, uh, that those accounts are not open just globally. Make sure that they are open only to, to your friends and family. And if you have something like a Twitter account that is public by nature, make sure you're not posting overtly personal stuff on there. Because again, that's where a lot of these scammers are going to be getting intelligence essentially to, to manip manipulate victims. Info. Another question that just came in, and it may be relevant um, to how you're doing business in, in the hotel room that yep. you're in. Um, the question is, when staying in a hotel, is it better to connect using your iPhone hotspot or the hotel Wi-Fi? Yeah, so, so as I mentioned, nowadays, it, because of the way that uh, it, you know, web communication works, and it's, it's almost all encrypted today, you know, uh, connecting to hotel Wi-Fi is much, 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 much less risky than it was five years ago, let's say. Um, so, I mean, when I, go to, when I go to hotels, I always connect to just to the, the hotel Wi-Fi just because of that. Um, I didn't, if you had asked me this question five years ago, I would only have been using a, a, a hotspot um, or I just would have been using my phone as, as a tool to sort of uh, to do anything. But to, nowadays, hotel Wi-Fi is not nearly as risky as it used to be or any and, public Wi-Fi. And, and so where does the virtual private network or the VPN um, utility come into, into your thinking there? So VPNs, in my opinion, there are two primary good use cases for a VPN. One is if you want to make sure that only certain people can connect to a network, uh, sort of like, generally like an enterprise network, then making, making, making sure they go through a specific VPN in order to do that. That's sort of use case number one. Use case number two is essentially pseudo anonymizing yourself to whatever website you're going to. Um, you know, I use a VPN in a, a lot of my day-to-day -day research and analysis simply so the end website can't easily know where I'm coming from. Um, that's not to say that they couldn't figure it out because there are a lot of ways to get around uh, VPN geolocation, um, but they can't easily do that. If you're talking about things like security, VPNs are worthless, quite frankly. Uh, do not ever use a VPN specifically for, for, for security because they aren't, there's, there's no reason to do that. Essentially what you're doing is you're, instead of saying, I don't, trust my local internet service provider, I'm going to trust this completely random VPN provider instead to receive all of, to, to route all of my uh, data through. That's essentially what you're doing. So VPNs are not useful for security. They're really just useful for uh, quasi anonymizing yourself online um, to the website that you're, that you're visiting or making sure that everyone's routing through a specific uh, IP address to get to a specific network. Okay, good, inf good information. Um, I think one last question, if, if it's okay, I know we're a little past five, but um, is there any way that I can look to see if any of my data has been compromised? Um, what's available out there? So the best website that's out there is, uh, is gonna be, have I been pwned? Uh, actually, I can probably put it in the chat. Uh, maybe I can, maybe I can't, I don't know. Can I put it in the chat? Is there's there a chat? A Q &A, there's only a Q&A feature for this webinar. Um, All right. So if you well, want to pose it as a question, you could type it in. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, well, 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 so I, I can provide it to, to Brooke and Emily um, sure. after this, and if you want to send it out. But so it's have I been pwned, which is have I been p w n e d dot com. Um, it's a great website that's been uh, around for a number of years now. Um, and essentially, what they do is the public repository of data breaches. So if you ever want to know, has my uh, have my credentials, has my name been compromised in a recent data breach? And in most cases, everyone's information has been compromised uh, because there are some massive ones out there. Then you can look, you can just do a free a free search on there and it'll, it'll just say, you know, search for this email address and it'll come back with all of the uh, recent breaches that 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 email address has been involved in. Um, that's the best uh, website to, to go to, to really just to have a really quick look um, of, you know, to see if your general information has been has been compromised. Wonderful. If I can squeeze one more in, one more question. Absolutely, David, go for it. In that, um, is there a virus or malware software that you recommend for people to use at home? Mm, um, so nowadays, for the most part, if you have a Windows computer, Windows Defender that comes on the computer is usually going to be good enough to stop most malware today. Uh, you know, you know, antivirus is very much kind of a thing of the past because the way that malware works today, it's it's much more dynamic than it used to be. So, you know, antivirus used to be uh, relatively useful when malware was more static in nature, but nowadays the behavior of malware changes so frequently, uh, sometimes minute to minute, second to second, that antivirus only has limited capabilities. Um, so that being said, you know, Windows Defender that comes you know, from Microsoft usually is good enough to, to do what you need to do. Um, but you know, if you want to beef it up a little bit with, with Norton or some of the other big antiviruses out there, you know, you they might provide a little bit of additional um, additional protection, but not too much. But I, I would definitely stress, as we've talked about today, you know, we're talking about malware for that, but most cyber attacks today won't be detected through antivirus because they aren't launched through uh, through technical means, right? So most right. most cyber attacks today are not technically sophisticated. They're going to be the BEC attacks, credential phishing. And that's not what antivirus is, is used to detect. Good. Well, wonderful information, Crane. Thank you very much. And thanks to those of you that have submitted questions. Um, if there are any questions that we did not get to, we will um, try to circle back on those um, and make sure that those questions do get answered. Um, so thank you. I'll, I'll turn it over to Brooke. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Crane. Uh, this was very informative. Um, from all of us here at Evans Maywell, thank you for attending today's seminar. We hope that the information was helpful and uh, be on the lookout for future webinars. We have more to come.